All right, great. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being any, you will have the webinar, we will be sending out an email like us the web on anytime during today's presentation. You have a question for either of our speakers, please just use your question and answer tab in your interface there and submit your question. And I'm sure we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also, at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. We also have two polling questions during today's webinar. When those polls are pushed out to you, you will see a little red dot. I believe it's red uh, that uh, will uh, show up next to your polling tab and uh, we can uh, hopefully get as many people as engaged as possible. All right, with that, I'm gonna shut up. Um, this is, uh, today's webinar is best practices for developing DevOps test management environments. Our speakers today are Mark Hornbeek, who is the CEO and Principal Consultant at Engineering DevOps, and Jeffrey Kies, who is the VP of Product at Platora. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to actually save bandwidth. I'm going to take myself off camera, put myself on mute. I'll be back at polling time. Uh, until then, you guys have fun, and I'll see you, uh, see you in a bit. That's awesome. Thanks, Charlene. I love doing webinars with, uh, uh, with you guys, and I especially like doing webinars with you, Mark. Um, if you haven't listened to uh, Mark before or, or heard, who is this Mark Hornbeat guy? You really ought to check out some of his work. It's great. There's a, a fantastic book he wrote called Engineering DevOps, and it's a super practical guide, sort of a how-to, uh, which is kind of your style, Mark. You, you're you great at kind of just breaking it all down. A lot of confusion and hype uh, and marketing around what is DevOps and how does it work. And um, what I like about the book is it's just super practical about how do you move forward from wherever you are from wherever you are to getting to the next step in, in terms of DevOps um, and uh, really practical. So if you haven't gotten it, uh, come to the Platora website. You can get a copy. Uh, just so you know, Mark isn't, you know, just uh, sitting up on the throne somewhere. Um, you can, uh, you know, in, in the throne of the gods somewhere, you can actually consult with Mark. Uh, you can get a hold of Mark. So please do. Um, he's, uh, he's a great resource for every team and, and can work with you. Um, well, Today, Mark, thanks for being here. Love having you on. What what are we going to learn about today? Uh, thanks, Jeff, for that wonderful introduction and uh, opportunity to talk again today with you and uh, DevOps.com. The <clears throat> this webinar is actually something that is near and dear to my heart. I've actually spent a lot of my forty five years, believe it or not, thinking about test environments <laughs> for software. Way back when I worked in a research organization for tel telecom and many yep. years in startups and so on. But so what we're going to learn about basically is, you know, test environments for software, how to manage those uh, and, you know, how you can develop uh, uh, your test environment uh, to be more towards what I'd call the best practice, state of the art, state of the practice. And in particular, how you can justify uh, improvements to your test environment because, you know, these things do cost money, and uh, the idea is that you need to have some kind of ROI case to justify that, typically in organizations. So we'll talk about how to do that as well, but um, something that I've had a lot of experience with over the years. Yeah, for sure. I, I know in my own experience of, of, of the development work I've done, test environments have been uh, somewhat of the Achilles heel. Um, you know, of mm -hmm. course... When I was doing things, I did them all wrong and and got to experience it. But now I'm watching other organizations. It's the same thing. It's, it seems like it's, uh, a, a, well, it is a really big problem. So, uh, well, take us through this. Um, we're using this word, you know, or this phrase, test environment management. It sounds kind of wild. What what is test environment management? So I tend to like to explain things in terms of what I call blueprints, which is nothing other than a big picture, sort of an engineering terminology. But this is the big picture for test environment management. At the top, you've got essentially a value stream, software mm -hmm. value stream for an application. You know, you think about everything that happens between planning through to integration, getting the artifacts potentially for release, and then doing a delivery and deployment and then the operation. So that's the value stream. 
if you look at the different steps along that value stream, there are a lot of places where you need to have a, an environment for testing you know, at, the de at the development stage, at the uh, integration stage, staging prior to deployment, and even during deployment and getting ready for that. There are other applications as well, but those are the main ones when you're talking about value streams. Uh, so how do you manage those things, right? How do you stand them up and how do you make them work and how do you release them when you're done? You want to be able to do all those things to be efficient. So that's what test environment management is all about. And we're talking about you know managing all the different kinds of resources required to execute a test. So the applications, the tools, the physical you know systems that are part of the test environment, virtual systems, if it's cloud and it, all of the infrastructure is code, all of those things are part of the so-called test environment that need to be managed so that you can actually do testing at every one of these stages. Yeah. What I it, are there other kinds of things you know? I organizationally, how do people typically kind of set this up? What do they What do they do for doing this? So that's what we're going to talk about. Basically, uh, I, you know, my, my experience is sort of several. I, I say five uh, levels of test environments management systems, and we're going to go through all that. Perfect. And you know, it feels like uh, in so many organizations when you first talk about test environments. Uh, the common I hear, well, that's, you know, Bob's got a, a couple of machines under his desk over there. We got a big virtual machine environment and and it's no problem. And what I typically hear uh, now being a vendor in this space, too, it's like where the big problems come is like the people that manage it, the, the infrastructure is typically like it's OK. But then you talk to the test teams and like, oh, my gosh, we're missing out on times. Uh, things aren't right. We've got the wrong things deployed and so forth. So um, how does this you know what what does this mean to to devops and your transformation on devops why why is it important well it's always been important even prior to devops you know with earlier you know waterfall models and so on it's often been a bottleneck in the you know the process of development and deployment because sure. of all those stages that need to be stood up but with devops it becomes even more important because now you have to do everything more quickly because devops is all about you know accelerating real lead time to market accel and accelerating the release frequency and doing that without, you know, uh, affecting quality or security in a negative way. So being able to stand up the test environments have to be even more efficient than ever to keep up with the speed of DevOps, if you like. So improving agility, reducing waste as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, testing, as you said, is often the biggest bottleneck in the value stream. When you do a value stream mapping exercise, I find that that's still true in many cases. Uh, so you know, and the test environment setup and and management is often the biggest component of that. Uh, when you consider how many stages of testing there are in a value stream, you can see that it definitely accumulates and adds up and becomes a major part of the total, if you like, delay in the management of, the, of a release in a, in a value stream. Uh, and at the same time, improving quality and risk management, you know, by having a more comprehensive view of what's being tested and having it auditable and facilitating automated testing better through um, being able to automate test environments is also a key benefit with good test environment management tools like the Pthora tools, uh, enabling continuous employ improvements by providing more intelligent insights and feedbacks to these test environments when they're implemented well. You know, they come with metrics and, you know, hooks that you can keep track of what's going on and then use that feedback to, to improve the value stream and even improve the application and the tests themselves. Absolutely. How do, um, what's your thoughts on costs and how costs fit into this? You know, I'm, I, I know these things aren't cheap, yeah, so there's different types of costs as you try to scale up test environments. So you have to this is where you know we're going to be talking about how to justify the costs. There are, you know, tool costs, there are resource costs, the, you know, the things that are being managed you, as you scale up, you want to be able to, you know, have more resources available as you get more efficient, be able to support more releases and more applications at the same time in parallel and have a good management system to keep track of that. So we're going to talk about costs specifically. Yeah. One of the points you raise here is you say, you know, you're going to improve quality and reduce your risk. How uh, how is quality related here? So, you know, if if I do better and manage my test environments, you're telling me I'm going to have better quality software delivery? Yeah, what happens is you get better coverage because you're going to be able to afford to do more tests in the same amount of time. So, mm -hmm. in effect, you're going to get, you know, better quality because of that and and that's also better security because some of those tests are security tests, right? Um so basically, it enables you to be able to do a better job, essentially, by having a better managed environment. Yeah. Well, and I remember one of the, again, 
did it wrong. I remember one of the cycles we ran, we were based on a on a Java virtual machine and and we had the wrong version during one of our regression cycles. And mm -hmm. and it came out that, oh wait, there is a bug in the latest version and it didn't really work, but we didn't catch that in our test environments because we weren't managing the environment to the right version. So we wasted a whole suite of time that it took for a full regression cycle. At that point, it not much of it was automated. A really big deal to kind of get this right. So and especially uh, one more comment on the on the DevOps side. So, does this do test environments slow down DevOps adoption if if they're not addressed? They can become the Achilles heel, you know, the the main bottleneck. So it's not necessarily slowing down adoption, but it's going to slow down your value stream, and therefore you're not going to get you're not going to be able to demonstrate the results that you'd hope to get. Um, therefore, you know, you may have trouble justifying going the next step in your DevOps adoption. You know, program your. Uh, so in that sense, it could slow it down. Gotcha. So you can do all this automation, get deployments out there, and then get stuck because, um, like one environment, one uh, prospect that I met with that still never got out of their way own way was. Um, um, I, I remember they commented. They said, "Yeah, we we provision brand new, you know, tin, brand new hardware for every environment we we need, and that process takes us about four months." So you better know four months in advance when you need a new environment. Um, yeah, it's crazy to me. So, mm -hmm. all right, well, let's get into you know the critical nature of of test environments. What's the what's the industry say about test environment management? Well, in general, you know, I've been in this game, like I say, for more than forty five years, mm -hmm. and actually, one of my first jobs uh, had to do with testing, and I realized right at that time that testing you know, is critical and it's also a bottleneck in uh, in the whole process of creating products and getting them deployed and delivered and getting the quality and all of that. And it's interesting, 45 years later, you know, there's a huge variation between those that are doing it well and those, you know, that are not. And unfortunately, there's still a lot that have a lot to learn in many organizations. The World Quality Report is one example report that explains that, you know, the you know testing and quality is still an under under you know underpinning key business driver for pretty much every major enterprise. Uh, you know it affects growth of the business, user satisfaction, cost, security. You know testing is critical, but if you ask a lot of senior leaders, they really you know especially on the business side, they'll many of them don't recognize it. That, yeah, testing is something engineering does. Um, they don't really pay attention to it. It seems to be not so sexy. They'd rather talk about the apps or maybe some other things. So getting awareness on you know this importance of testing and the test environments are a key part of that uh, is critical. There's a report by Undo that's listed here, another example. There's plenty of reports out there. If you look at the you know scale up the cost of testing from their results, they're saying 88% of enterprises are doing at least some continuous integration, not necessarily continuous deployment. Right. And um, you know 35% are doing quick you know frequent code changes. Um, but developers are spending a lot of time, on average, 13 hours reproducing and fixing failures, failed tests. So reproducing the test environment is a key part of it as well. Even once you have the test environment, you find a problem, then you want to go back and reproduce it between QA and developers. Huge amount of time, 620 million hours per year is estimated, which equates to 61 billion annually salaries or 1.2 trillion in shareholder value loss. So this scales up pretty fast. And you can see that when you think about you know all these different Products and applications are they're part of a value stream, and if if the right. test env testing and test environments are a big bottleneck, then that scales up pretty fast. They're big numbers. Yeah, really big numbers. And I don't yeah. think there there's sort of an unspoken cost here too that you know your most critical resource to you know building are the developers. And and if during a test cycle there's a problem discovered in an environment. Um, and, you know, as some of the studies I've seen from um, prospects and, and even customers as they measure, you know, what's the breakdown of our of the problems that we had in our environments when or when the when the bug is raised, it turns out to be an environment problem. The first person that's called is the developer because they have to derive, you know, was it an environment? Was it a, uh, you know, some kind of code bug? Nobody knows. That interruption has twofold impact in that one, not only are they not getting stuff done on their current work, so it's a disruption, but mm -hmm. it's uh, it's wasted time, right? If you only had gotten the environment right and could verify it uh, on the way in, um, it, it, I don't know, it just, it's massive. It's a, it's a very significant, um, um, you know, problem to address. So lots of value here. So we have a survey. And Charlene, I think you're going to help us with a survey. 
I think you're going to help us with a survey. Excellent. You should see a survey on your screen and clicky the button. <laughs> so the question is, you know, what extent are test environments a bottleneck in your development pipelines today? Um, you know, do you have no idea? Where do they sit? You know, it's a serious bottleneck. It's uh, a serious bottleneck in just one stage or end to end, uh, somewhat problematic, or, you know, you're really not having any problems at all with test environments. Of course, then um, maybe you already got this solved and you're trying to, you know, see, uh, kind of see what the rest of the world is doing. Yeah, so mm -hmm. sorry, my, uh, apparently I can't have a microphone without my camera. So <laughs> I was chattering to you and nobody was hearing me, so. Oh, good. Just like any other day, I suppose. But, okay, <laughs> yeah. but yes, yes, the polling question should be up on your screen now. We'll go ahead and leave it up for a little bit. Let folks go ahead and make your uh, decision. And then um, uh, we'll just leave it up. You guys can continue with your presentation after about, I would say, two minutes or so. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And um, you guys, uh, Jeff, you should be able to see the results at that point. You guys can can discuss them. Yep. Um so let me, I can see the results as right now. Let me, let me talk to what I'm looking at. Um, there's an answer saying, you know, there's no bottlenecks related to test environments. Um, and 5% of you, 5% said, oh, that's where we're at. I'm telling you that first because I want you to know this problem is massive. There ain't nobody that's got this completely solved. Even if you're all automated, there's still issues to deal with, with um, verification. There's always more in the journey. Or frankly, you just don't know. Um, if you're not sure how much of a problem the test environments are in your space, go talk to your testers and see about availability. Look at their time for availability. And two, look at the defects that are raised during the uh, non-prod integration UAT phase and do a quick breakdown to look at how many of those were actually environment. Look at the resolution of those bugs. And whenever the developer says uh, environment related, you should track that because it's going to start giving you some kind of information around it. Now, uh, the other answers are, are even more interesting. 15% um, or 16% said, no idea. I don't know where it's at. So uh, see prior conversation. Step one, do those two little bits of investigation. It is really worth your time. Uh, you want to change things quickly. Just, hey, here's two metrics. Testers say that uh, environment availability is, uh, you know, 70%. <laughs> wow, that means 30% of your time is wasted because the environments aren't available. Oh, my gosh. Or worst, developers are saying, we don't have time. Oh, my gosh, that's bad. So that leaves really 80% uh, are in some area of serious bottlenecks end to end, um, serious bottlenecks just at one stage. Um, and, and the majority are run, you know, almost half, 45% said that environments are somewhat problematic in at least one stage. So this is significant. You're not alone. Everybody's dealing with this is part of the journey of doing DevOps. So yeah, one, one thing I would point out, by the way, is the word bottlenecks is probably not quite enough uh, because you can have bottlenecks in terms of uh, calendar time, lead time, but there's also a different type of bottleneck in terms of actual effort. So both of those types of bottlenecks are interesting, actually. Very true. Yeah. Well, let's move on. All right. You guys want me to close the poll now? Sure. We'll we'll move on and and jump into the next step of uh, the conversation. So, all right. Well, how do you get started on this? And what are the different phases? And where do I go? So. You know, Mark, what I love about everything you do is you're always like, well, let me give you the program. Let me give you the blueprint of what you're going to get done and how how do you measure where you're at? Let's take us through this because you've done the same thing for test environment management. Right. So I have this five step, you know, breakdown that you're seeing here that expresses uh, different phases or capability levels of, of mm -hmm. um Test environment management. It starts with chaos, um, and you know, you, you some of you are probably not at that level, but you know, some are. Uh, where you really have people that are trying to use test environments, they don't often know. You know, we're going to go through what, what that means, but basically, it's very chaotic, right? You you just don't have an organized test environment management system at all, 
Uh, the next step is typically you have some dedicated setups. So these people are happy because they don't have to ask for a setup. They have dedicated setups, but then it can be expensive. if You've got a lot of people that have dedicated setups. So mm -hmm. that's the other factor. And then you might say, well, we want to share rather than have a little, everybody having a dedicated setup. It's too expensive. So then you go to some somewhat of a automated system. It's somewhat uh, it's more semi-automated where you have tickets and people serving the tickets to address the requirements for test environments as they're needed. And the next logical step is you automate the whole process of setting up and releasing test environments, you know, the whole test environment that you need. And you maybe can have some standards to select from. And finally, you know, at the highest level, if you think about what really knows what test environments you need, mm -hmm. the test, the test themselves. So the most sophisticated level is you have the test environment requirements built into your tests. And the test orchestrator, the test execution system, is, uh, you know, if you like fetching the test environment it needs uh, and releasing it when it doesn't need it anymore. So that those are five different levels and I've experienced all of those. So where you need to get to depends on where you're at now in this scale. And we're going to talk about how you can f figure that out and what you could do. Love it. And, and if you don't know where you're at, you're probably at the first phase. And um, that's the that's the whole point of why you're here. So mm -hmm. and this journey is actually not that hard. It won't take you a lot to to follow along. And if you need help, um, please reach out to either of us. Um, ask questions here in the Q&A and we'll talk more about it. But let's dive into chaos. Um, talk a little bit more about, you know, what is it and why it's bad? Okay. Uh, yeah, so chaos is the first level of maturity, if you like. You know, you really, in this case, you've got a team that's trying to do testing. They don't really have a plan for the test environment. They don't really have any rules that, or, that manage the test environment. It's sort of survival of the fittest. Whoever needs to test something, they'll run around and find what they need. <laughs> but there isn't really a, a you know standard playbook for doing that. Uh, yeah. So each test is essentially a science project. You, you haven't got processes or resources well-defined, very manual, few tools, few, auto, few bits of automation, if any. Um, problem with this is, of course, there's a lot of waste, people running around uh, trying to find resources that may or may not exist. Uh, lots of bottlenecks in terms of effort as well as calendar time. The quality is not there because you probably are missing some coverage. You can't set up the environment you need, so you do, you make do. Uh, you can't audit what's going on because you don't have any way to track it. Generally yep. speaking, poor governance and security because of that. Don't have enough resources. Pretty much people get frustrated. The morale is affected. And you, it's difficult to repeat something you already did because you you, you know, you, you don't have a repeatable environment and it doesn't scale very well. Uh, you know, my own experience, I've, I've seen plenty of organizations at this level, very modern, large organizations. Mm -hmm. I did a assessment with a U.S. state government agency. They were trying to get their value stream for a particular set of apps from 16 weeks down to six weeks. And a lot of that improvement was going to come from, you know, trying to move their test environment to something, at least to a, a ticket-based system in, in that case. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I remember in my own world, I was a, a dev manager and we were doing a report out with, uh, you know, we'd done all this really cool stuff, brand new kinds of code and and had this uh, really cool new demo that we'd put together and we're just proud of it. The user interface was awesome and we're doing our report out and it just, it fell over. And I, you know, we'd done all sorts of testing with it. We had really worked it over, come to find out that while we were doing our report out, uh, one of my uh, uh, QA team was uh, running a load test on the same environment, and we didn't know. But you know, we had no idea. So we're in the middle of the demo. Of course, it's falling over and blowing up. Mm -hmm. um, I have another prospect that said before Plator, it was um, it was like Russian roulette. They never knew who was using what. They didn't know, um, you know, if if one application got upgraded, they didn't know who else was going to get impacted. It was it was a challenge, and it's a big challenge, and. Uh, while my story is funny and just egg on my face, these are real. Um, I mean, this is a business. We we need to you know uh, improve the quality we've got. So, um, well, I guess that talks about moving on and moving into dedicated environments where we do something different. What what does this look like? So, a dedicated environments is where you you know again you've got a team they need to do testing, yep. but in this case you've pre-configured some standard test environments and they have access to that 100%. So they don't really have to ask for anything. They've spent the money, they have the environment they need and they don't have to reserve anything. The test environments are ready to support, you know, even the worst case 
scenarios. Um, so they're basically throwing money at the problem. And maybe mm -hmm. that can work in a circumstance where these test environments are really simple. But in this you know, world with all these different variations of operating systems and topologies of systems, that's not typical. Typically, the, the test environments are complex networks of things. And, um, and if you had to have a standard dedicated one for every team, that can be really expensive. So the pros are basically it's efficient from a labor point of view. Maybe some of those people that said they don't have a test environment problem are the ones that have this circumstance, right? <laughs> they're happy. But maybe their managers aren't happy because they're spending a lot of money on that, providing dedicated environments. There are very few bottlenecks because you know they don't have to ask for anything. It's repeatable because they're dedicated. It's auditable, simple governance, security, good morale. Uh, the problem is you've got a lot of wasted resources compared to being able to share a resource because often you're going to have test environments sitting there not being used when people that own the dedicated environments aren't using them. Uh, quality coverage can also be an issue because you now have some fixed environments and maybe things will come along because of new developments and that you want to make changes to that dedicated environment. That can be troublesome sometimes. So new feature code quality can suffer. Uh, often you don't have enough resources to support all these different environments. And it generally doesn't scale as you get many applications and releases. Setting up dedicated environments for all of them can be troublesome. So, you know, again, I have some examples. Um, work with a large e-commerce uh, organization, company that, you know, global e-commerce site that had an agent um, suite uh, service for serving their different uh, sales agents. Uh, they were trying to get down from, they had a six-week lead time on their value stream for their primary application, wanting to get down to one week. About half of that time was going to come from uh, moving their dedicated environments into more uh, ticket-based uh, and also saving a bunch of time, sa saving a bunch of money at the yep. same time. And the reason I, they didn't reduce this... it because there were different parts to the, they were going to microservices and they wanted to be able to do more parallel work and therefore they needed to be able to share things better than they were before. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, do you think, uh, you know, in your, in your travels, I, you know, what I see most is this is where most people are, right? You got a uh, named environment, you know, uh, you start naming planets for environments. You start naming, uh, uh, <laughs> colors or spectrums or, um, I, I think most people are here. Um, and, uh, this, you know, the various labs that are available, uh, a couple comments that I'll make too is, um, uh, I, I think a lot of these environments because they're not super well managed, um, have other issues that, you know, are being dealt with. How do you deal with maintaining the infrastructure and the hardware? It's really hard to coordinate that with the team. Um, and that was always a challenge, uh, as well, you know, a couple of years ago, there was a significant, uh, virus outbreak. A lot of times these environments, because they're either copied or, or, you know, just restoring one image to another, um, they don't end up being well managed and they end mm -hmm. up being a breeding ground for security threats. And in some companies, the test environments were, you know, ground zero, Hey, it got in the worm replicated. Now it's, it's all over the place. Um, a significant risk for not keeping these things um, well up to date. And then, of course, well, if it's not on the latest of stuff, you know, latest operating system, web servers, app server uh, components, virtual machines, so forth, is it really a valid test for all the work that's been done? Because it's a massive investment of time for everything that goes into them. Um, and I love that you mentioned costs because, you know, in, in, in the bigger the company you get, these costs are significant really really big and so to have you know one environment pluto versus you know whatever whatever your naming convention is um gets to be bad and so i'm sure we'll talk about some of that but let's let's move on to the next phase because if you're here which i think most people are let me show you what the next step looks like in your journey towards um devops which is uh your ticket based tell us about ticket based so ticket based is the idea that you now treat your test environments instead of being dedicated, you know, at least have some portion of them that are the resources there are shared so they can be configured uh, according to a request. The request is coming in through a ticket typically, uh, you know, an IT ticket or whoever is supporting the tickets for test environments. Uh, there are usually some configuration standards so that people can ask for, hey, I want, you know, that variation or this variation or maybe some custom variation. Mm -hmm. But basically they're being handled by tickets. So the tester is issuing a ticket to for a particular setup, configure, and even to release the, the setup. Maybe they get a you know a, a time bomb or something that releases it for them. But for the most part, you know, there's some kind of 
ticket um, transaction going on to, to affect the test environment. Now you've got some centralized management of the test process and resources because you can see what's going on with tickets and keep track of which environments and which resources are being used because you've got a, you know, an audit trail. So this is a lot more, if you like, labor efficient from the point of view of you know managing the test environments. Um, it's also auditable because you've got mm -hmm. the audit trail. You've got a lot more governance opportunities. You can uh, actually can be more secure again because of the audit trails. You know who's testing what, and you know what they're doing. Uh, generally speaking, it's good morale um, because you've got a process that's clean and consistent. Problem is uh, repeatability. You may not get the same exact environment when you ask for it. You may get something equivalent. Uh, <laughs> and you know you can have bottlenecks because you now have a ticket system instead of a dedicated environment. Compared to the dedicated, you've got some bottlenecks. It's not fully automated. <laughs> Quality coverage can be affected if you. If, depending on how you set up your ticket system, if you only have a limited number of choices, uh, then maybe you know you don't get the coverage you need for a particular test, and may not scale because you know if you if you want to have some customized environment for you know a particular you know high performance application or something, maybe you don't have a choice for that or you have to go outside the system mm -hmm. to deal with it. So these are just some examples. Um, an example here, I work with a network service provider. And they were trying to get a value stream for uh, one of their network um, switches, basically, down from a four-month lead time to one month. And, and again, almost half of that savings was going to come from uh, automating the ticket, you know, the, the request protocol for test environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, that's wild. What, um, there's an organizational implication here, too. Um, you know, I, who's who's responding to the tickets? Yeah, so that's organizational dependent. Uh, if it's a heavy centered engineering organization, you might even have an engineering team, like a DevOps team or something doing that. But often it's an IT group that is re whoever's responsible for the infrastructure is typically doing this. Uh, but I've seen a lot of different, you know, actual implementations of different, you know, different parts of the organization being set up to respond. Uh, because test environments, if they're most efficiently managed, you're, you're, you're really treating the entire pool of test resources from dev all the way through to staging, maybe not through to deployment, but all of that as a configurable resource. And that's the, if that's the case, then you need a fairly significant resource that's usually set up as, a, as an IT ticket organization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and I've seen many environments where there's multiple vendors. Um, and, you know, hey, somebody's got the SAP, somebody's got, uh, you know, one of the financials uh, or healthcare, and, and so they've got to have all these pieces come together as well. Um, do you, have you seen that work with a ticket-based environment management as well? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, that's one of the problems that, you know, you face with DevOps in general is just collaboration and coordination and communication across the different teams. And that's certainly true in this case as well with test environments. And you know, having a good test management system can help with that. Actually, it's another way that they can communicate together and get common results. And Very share cool. resources. Yeah. Very cool. Well, mm -hmm. let's go on to the next step, uh, which is automated. Um, talk to us about automated. What does automated look like? <clears throat> so automated. There's a lot of things you can automate with test environments. You know, ultimately, what you're doing is automating the entire transaction, which is, you know, the a test person, a developer, or a QA person knows what they want. They somehow have a way of specifying what they want in a system. That's now a you know like a, a an automated protocol that mm -hmm. rather than going through a ticket, <clears throat> and the test environment management system acts as a you know an orchestrator that sets up the test environment according to the requirements in the you know in the in the uh, request. Sure. And then you know it also can deal with. Uh, changing the test environment as needed, including releasing it. So the whole protocol from you know request through to release and everything in between is now managed in an automated fashion as much as possible. You can have different configuration standards now. You can have variations on that. Uh, generally speaking, the user is issuing some commands, but the command is not to a person in a ticket. It's to an orchestrator. So there's an orchestrator dealing with all the automation and uh, all of that. Or the orchestrator provides a central point for management of all the test process and resources. So you get all the benefits of a ticket-based system, but in addition, you get fewer bottlenecks. You now have the opportunity for higher quality coverage because you've got higher 
you know, real-time variations possible and scalability, because again, you've got a large pool of test resources that can be scaled according to an automated request. Those are just some benefits. Love um, it. Yeah. What's the investment like to get to automated? I'm going to talk about investments. Uh, again, you know, it depends a lot on what your app is and what your test resources are. But uh, one of the investments, of course, is a tool. Uh, mm -hmm. You need a, the automated tool. So if you can either do it yourself, which I don't recommend, or use tools like the Plutora tool or others that can automate for you uh, out of the box a lot of these things. Very cool. Yeah. Um, how uh, do I need to go from, you know, if I'm if I already have dedicated, can I just jump straight to automated or is it best to go to ticketed ticket base first or what's my what's why go through that journey? In other words, well, you can certainly jump these levels, but in effect, you're going to be, you know, as, at least mentally going through those levels, because before you can do automated, you have to be able to define some kind of configuration requirement. Right. So that's what the ticket would normally say. So whether you implement a ticket-based system and just implement the automated system instead with that requirements back is a choice. But, um, you know, I, I generally recommend, you know, take things one step at a time, get experience with a ticket-based system before you start automating everything. Um, but if you have confidence that you know what your requirements are, then, you could, yeah, you can jump to automated. There's no reason why you have to stay there. Gotcha. I, I suppose one of the aspects could be um, so you focus your automation work. I mean, sure, it's, you know, once you get to automate it, great. You don't need the ticketing anymore. You've left that behind. But it, there's an investment of time required to do all the work of automating as well because, you know, it, it, it takes time and it takes time to get it right and time to maintain it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, knowing which things should be automated, which things maybe, maybe there's some stuff that will always stay as ticket based. That's okay. Um, you'll have to decide your investment. Yeah, yeah. Or you might have a hybrid ticket, to, you know, together with automated. All of these things could be hybrid. You could have even some dedicated environments. Absolutely. But, yeah. Well, let's get to test driven. So test driven is kind of a state of the art. I don't see that many organizations actually doing this, but I've certainly experienced it with some of my own, you know, employments as well as some clients. But the general idea is the tests themselves have the specification, if you like, of what they need for testing, what the environment is, and the tests, you know, effectively are the ones that are issuing the request to the orchestrator in mm -hmm. a dynamic fashion as the tests are scheduled, uh, the, you know, the test uh, requirements go out to the to orchestrator, and essentially it's the same process as automated, but now, you know, the source is not a person, it's the tests themselves, and the people are, you know, have they have a structure for defining tests, um, that um, you know that that do that basically. Gotcha. Um, have you? How have you seen this be effective? How is it effective? Wow, this is kind of the ultimate because now you have the ultimate control over your test environment at a very, you know, modular, almost micro level. Uh, you, if you think about, let's say, I don't know. I'm, I, a lot of my background is in the network environment. So, you know, circuit cards or even portions of a circuit card could be a resource in this case, right? And you can mix and match depending on what your tests require. Whereas, you know, without it, you're probably looking at more like a, a system level uh, automation. So you can get really a lot of scalability, a lot of flexibility and very, very dynamic. You can also do auto scaling and, you know, gross horizontal and vertical auto scaling with with this according to the test requirements and according to your schedule requirements. Maybe you want to have a, a value stream lead time really fast this time, but next time it doesn't have to be. So you can afford to, you know, maybe not use as much of your test environment. So there's a lot of ways you can scale and make it efficient. With this gotcha. Level. Well, I, so <clears throat> give us a high level, uh, you know, comparison of the different phases and, um, you know, where things are at. What What's it look like and how do you measure yourself? So this is essentially, this chart's essentially just a summary of what I've been saying, you know, the, given the five levels on the left and the measures of, you know, of benefit along the right axis. Uh, so if you're at chaos, it's, you know, there's a lot of red there <laughs> and you really don't want to be there. If you want to use this chart, maybe you can use it to help justify, you know, moving to the next level. Uh, dedicated solves a lot of issues. It just unfortunately, you, you end up with, you know, problems with, variability and, and even costs. Um, automated is really where you would like to get to if you can afford to do it. Again, there's tooling involved. And if you really wanna you know, become a, a unicorn, then test-driven has got benefits beyond you know, 
what I see most people doing, but you get a lot of value there. Yeah. Um, wow. I'm noticing a, a couple of questions in the Q and a asking about uh, multi vendor uh, test environment. How do you manage multi vendor test cases in a automated TEM phase? That's an interesting question. Yeah, so that's not, not unusual at all. If, the, if you if you mean multi-vendor in terms of being able to configure tests, each vendor as a resource. Let's say I don't know. Again, they've got two different styles of a of an of a service, and you want to test both of them. Then there's two different vendors involved. You want to make sure your test cases are applicable in both cases. But then it's just a matter of you know if you've got an automated environment, you can select the one that is you're testing at one time, run them in parallel if you've got the resources or run them serially. The test environment management system will allow you to schedule accordingly whatever you're, whatever you have in your resource pool. And that's precisely what tools like Plutora can help you with. Um, yeah. Anything, uh, I dare say, I don't want to say every one of our customers, but every one of our customers has to deal with multi-vendor issues, both from provisioning, testing, uh, you know, uh, acceptance tests, smoke tests, what you name it. Um, mm -hmm. That's part of why you use a tool so that you can help solve these problems and put them together. Well, I think we have another survey. Not think, I, I know. So <laughs> Charlene, take us away on, on getting another survey out there. And this is about what tools or information do you need to provide um, uh, to management to persuade the improvement of test environment management? So you know, I, I did see a question in the Q&A like, uh, how, do I, how do I tell management we, we want to do better? <laughs> and I'd love to get your thoughts. You know, how, how do we tell them? What do they need so that they'll, they'll enable us to spend some money on improving this so ultimately we can improve the quality and, and um, our reliability and predictability of software delivery? So go ahead and, and uh, answer those as what you think uh, you need. So some of the questions, some of the answers there are no idea. Hey, ROI calculations would help. Uh, any industry best practices, case studies, uh, tool comparison, competitive guides. Love to know what you think. Are these multiple choice or are there? In this, choose one. I think it was uh, choose one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Probably should have made it multiple choice, huh? All good. So Okay. Some people may have multiple. Yeah. Uh, just another uh, couple of seconds here and we'll watch the results come in. So um, Mark, I, I know you can't see the results, but let me t tell you what I'm seeing. Um, the, the no idea response came in at about 10%. So 10% of you have no idea what to do. And we're going to talk about that right now next because it's important. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest answer is uh, ROI calculations. In fact, uh, more than a third, well, about a third said ROI calculations. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> um, and, and then the next most popular answer was a tool comparison, competitive guide. Um, there's an industry best practice, uh, adherence, and, and then the, it was about 20%, and then the, um, uh, the smallest answer was 15% for case studies. So uh, good news uh, I have for folks. Um, we're about to talk about ROI and and how you calculate ROI, what it looks like. Good news for folks is if you come to the Patora website, you'll find that we have case studies, tool comparison guides, and industry best practices. In fact, if you look in the chat, um, I believe uh, Michelle sent out a link to a, a guide from EMA. I highly recommend go through that guide. It is just, it's gold. You'll, you'll find, that's all you need. Just, you know, it, one slide, here it is. Um, and if you need any questions or have any questions and, and would like folks to talk to, um, I know Steve Hendrick at, at EMA, and I'm, I'm confident we could uh, uh, help make some connections there because he's always interested in furthering that bit of research. So, well, let's move on to ROI calculations because um, <laughs> this is kind of interesting. It's like um, at, its, at its most dumb level, how do you how do you do an ROI calculation? 
Yeah, so ROI is a simple thing to spell, but in reality, you know, I spent a lot of my career agonizing over this as an engineering manager leader. At one point, I even went off and did an MBA because I found my engineering training wasn't enough to uh, be qualified to talk about ROI in front of a lot of finance people that I needed to in order to get justification mm -hmm. for projects when I was running engineering teams. Um, and what I found actually is that, it, you know, there are a lot of benefits, but some of them are not hard enough to satisfy the finance and accounting people. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can talk about you know, personal satisfaction. How do you measure that? You can talk even about revenue benefits. That can be measured, but it's hard to justify, actually, uh, because other things might have an impact on the benefit. You know, people say, well, that wasn't because of your improvement in test environments. That was because we had a better product. <laughs> but what I found sticks, right, with the people in finance and that is talk about savings, right? Mm -hmm. How much is it going to cost you to implement a test environment management project? And what is the relative cost of savings if you did or didn't do that, right? So you can now make a comparison and then come up with an ROI calculation that they will actually believe and you can validate it very easily as you implement the project. So it's, it, it, they're numbers that you can actually count. And that's why I recommend this type of an ROI calculation. So really the calculation is the total savings that are attributed to the enhancements and then the cost of implementing. So you can lay all that out and I've got a chart coming up that gives some exa an example for an actual project that I did. But that to me is the, is the crux of it. Don't try to justify the ROI on some of the other factors. You can certainly list them as other factors, mm -hmm. but the real core justification is on cost savings or something yeah. like this. What's funny to me is it would seem so brain dead simple, like buy a tool. It's, you know, once you do, you're going to, you're going to see the savings that come from, uh, you know, all the things we've been talking about, the utilization, the wasted time, the, uh, the downtime of development, the, uh, wasted opportunity from from development, the wasted test time. I mean, it's just it, I, of the compelling stories that I've ever been told. This seems like the easiest one to to work through from a management point of view, um, mm -hmm. because the numbers are well, they're massive. Um, so take us through um, an example here, so we can talk about what the uh, cases were, because these numbers like are mind boggling to me. Yeah, so that's something else to be aware of. Usually your finance department has some ROI threshold. Uh, and if you come in below the that, even though it's, they believe your numbers, they may not accept the project anyway. So right. you want to you be aware of that going in. What are the ROI you know, numbers that they're looking for to approve projects? Because keep in mind that you know the same money is competing with other projects. So that's something to bear in mind, first of all. This uh, chart is actually... Um, you know, without naming names, an actual project I was involved in. It was a network switching company. And, um, you know, we were one division was trying to get basically from chaos all the way through to test driven uh, over a period of essentially it was two years. It was a two year effort. So it was over a two year budget span. But starting with, you know, chaos um, there, basically we did put in place, first of all, 150 K just to do an inventory, an inventory of the resources that we were we had and also an inventory of the people that are using it <laughs> and needed to use it so we kind of categorize characterize that didn't really change anything by doing an inventory but that was the baseline right so it didn't really have roi just to do that work but it was an essential part of getting to you know dedicated which was the next level and, uh, and we put in place another 500k in order to get dedicated we found out we needed to you know actually uh, build out the resources that we had and, you know, start automating some of the inventory management and uh, tracking that better and utilization so we could get some numbers to justify going even further forward in the project to the next levels. Uh, so in this case, we actually worked out a savings of 1.4 million in this project. The reason that happened is we were able to, you know, more effectively manage the environment. We were able to get more applications out and releases out in the same amount of time. So it didn't, the savings didn't come from uh, necessarily um, uh, just purely just bottlenecks, but just having a more managed environment. We were able to get use this, use these resources to get more out by figuring out, you know, from the inventories and that where we had holes to f to be able to fill in, you know, environments that could cover more applications and therefore more releases. The next level, ticket based, uh, we put in place a ticket system, of course, more sophisticated, you know. Uh, 
ways of standing up environments because you don't want to just have a ticket system without any ability for somebody to go off and implement it. So, you know, there were some tooling associated with that. Uh, and again, a little bit more in terms of resources. Didn't really change a whole lot in terms of the number of releases, but uh, we were able to get more applications covered and that cost about one and a half million. The ROI here, uh, incremental was you know two to one over the previous one, five to one over the original estimate. Uh, that was now the basis to automate because now we had you know if you like a manual MVP that we could automate um, and adding more resources again, better sophisticated tools. Uh, we got a lot of you know we doubled the number of releases we could get out of the same amount of time. Uh, we were able to get more applications covered. Uh, and a lot of savings over, this is a three year view, by the way, the uh, savings view. It's 11, 11 million, 11 and a half million. Um, the ROI here was 10 to one over ticket and 15 to one over the original. Uh, and finally, we went all the way to test driven and um, a lot of expense. You know, here we had to re-architect the test cases themselves to be able to have the ability to drive the automated request processes. Uh, we didn't have a, so much more hardware, but a little bit. Uh, huge savings. We were able to get a lot more releases out and a lot more applications. Uh, it was a five to one, six to one uh, ROI improvement over the last phase, but a 20, 20 to one over the original. So you can see these numbers are pretty cool. I think in this particular organization, finance had a, uh, a, a 14 to one ROI ba ba baseline. So we had to sell them on the idea that, you know, we're going to get to automate it. Uh, when we, we so we got the first tranche of, of investment money all the way up to level four, and then the next year we did level five. That's awesome, fantastic! A lot of big stuff. So takeaways. Yeah, so uh, this is just saying that you can follow this model. It's probably not the only one. There's probably other models, but I happen to like this approach. I find it works. Okay, take your test environment, figure out where you are, chaos, dedicated, ticket-based, automated, test-driven. Think about you know, how complete those are, what you could do better. Um, every new phase introduces different practices, but you get benefits and the ROI can be justified based on the, you know, the cost savings alone. You can certainly use other types of benefits which have a financial impact you know revenue improvement because of more releases uh you know morale so you don't have turnover and people and all that those are ten tend to be if you like soft benefits the real benefits that, that will help your case but the cost-based savings tend to be the ones that are really hard that finance is going to say yeah we we buy that if you and, and you can also demonstrate it as you implement the projects a little easier absolutely you know and I'll tell you in every case that we've implemented test environment management, the the ROI is impressive. It it is an order of um, well months, like under six months even. Um, massive dollars we're talking about here for just getting from where you're at to ticketing, um, and then on the further stages of investing time and resources to add the automation and the additional tools and so forth. Um, to go down that path, there's even larger um, uh, ROI. This is yeah, great. If you look at an enterprise, I just showed you that example for you know one. Essentially, it was a you know it was a, a, a large department, but across the enterprise, the same benefits scale. <laughs> so the total number is massive. It is, and right. it's just funny. The the you know if you're a, a uh, five developers and and you know you got one environment probably not that big of a deal, but as soon as you're thousands of developers, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I I was reminded by uh, uh, one of our customers that they are a bigger software company than Facebook, um, and they're a healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. It's mind boggling to think of the number of developers they have. Um, uh, why is Platora here? Hey, this is what we do. We are a value stream management platform, meaning we help people manage value streams um, from idea to production. Part of that value is that we it, it ingest data from across the tool chain and bring it into our common data model. As we ingest it, we unify the tool chain, converging it, if you will, so that we can unify data that's from planning to delivery to uh, all the way into operations. Part of the secret sauce is that we add two more significant areas of functionality on top of that data that we bring in. One is management orchestration with the key area that we're talking about here of 
um, really managing hybrid environments. Those are in the cloud, those that are automated, those that are you know completely manually driven. Uh, we have a ticketing system all around uh, dealing with the uh, environments themselves. We keep track of the configurations. We coordinate them as they relate to every release and every pipeline. We tell you at any point in time what features have what builds, which have what artifacts that are on what environments. You can see the whole pipeline from beginning to end. That's what we do. And we'll help you in that journey of knowing which environments are the most contentious, have the most usage, and which ones are prime for next steps of automation. As you go from ticketed to automated to test driven, we'll help you down that journey and provide all the management reporting that you need uh, and the analytics to guide those efforts. Well, that management analytics and reporting takes us to really the other big value of the platform is that we take all the data that we ingest out of the platform, all the orchestration and puppeteering, and include it in a cloud-based analytics engine. Um, metrics, KPIs, comparative metrics, um, traceability, all things that are powered by the platform itself, and it's all in the cloud. You just hook it up to your tools, log in, you get everything you need. You get a, a home base, if you will, for managing test environments as, as part of the solution. Um, I better hurry along. We only have a couple minutes for questions. Um, let me see here. Um, there's another question about um, any recommendations or resources for ways to handle test environments that need to integrate with multiple vendor products each scaling out, creating new environments um, for the for the integrations, uh, results in multiple integration environments tied to a single UAT vendor environment. Right, how do you do that, Mark? Well, you just described it in your prior chart. I mean, the, you need you basically need a test environment platform, right? That, that has got plugins for all those different types of things, or at least configurable so that you can add things that don't currently have a plugin. And that's exactly what Plutora offers. And I'm not just trying to do a sales pitch, but that's there are other tools out there, which I won't name names because I'm on a Plutora webinar. <laughs> but <laughs> but you know, I'm just saying that they, you know, that that's the that is the solution. Make sure you've got a framework, a backbone a test environment that you can plug into all these different systems. Uh, you don't certainly don't want to implement a different one for each of the vendors. That would be back to chaos. In fact, we have one customer that has one, so they have a, a mishmash of vendors inside the environment. And one of the vendors was frustrated in dealing with problems in their environment caused by other vendor stuff. So what they did is they actually reached out to us as a partner, implemented Plutora to manage all the inbound requests, and then they acted as the intermediary distributed across all the various vendors that are in the environment there. Um, we can do all sorts of different uh, uh, methodologies. I'll say one other thing on the ROI. Check out our website. There's a piece for the uh, business case of test environment management, and um, it's a it's another really good piece. Uh, reach out to us. Um, don't be shy. Uh, grab us on LinkedIn. We can walk you through how to do an ROI case. Please let us help you in this journey um, as you're trying to modernize your test environments. There's no reason to you know, not ask for help and don't try to go this alone. You can get help. You can get it for free. Uh, you know, worst case is it doesn't hit the threshold and, and, you know, okay, you can't do that, but that telling you right now, that's not going to happen. Uh, if you're interested or if you're here, you're, you've got a pain point and we can help you down that journey. So don't be shy. Um, and off to the races. So I think we have about two minutes and I think there's some, some cards, uh, to hand out Charlene. Is that right? Hi, everybody. I'm Jade from the DevOps team. Charlene's having a little bit of issues, so I'm going to be a voice from beyond. We do, <laughs> have, we do have some gift cards that we're going to hand out. Our winners today are Jan M, John H, Jerry P, and Kellyanne P. So we are going to reach out to you all via email to get those gift cards sent over to you. In the meantime, um, we just wanted to remind everyone that today's presentation has been recorded. In about three hours, we'll get that link sent to you via email so you can go ahead and rewatch at your convenience. And in the meantime, we want to thank Jeff and Mark for their expertise and their time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care and be safe. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.